Here we go. I want us to start to thank God and thank Him for our lives, worship Him in the beauty of His holiness. We just want to love God every time we come into His presence. Um, together as a family, let's just love God and bless His name. Let's begin to pray. Father, we thank you. What a blessing to come into your presence today, tonight. What a blessing of God to come into the, your presence, to meet together with your people, to meet with your family, to fellowship and uh, walk through your word, to, to um, hear from you, oh God. What a blessing, what a blessing, what a privilege, what a privilege. We come, oh God, into your presence with thanksgiving. Lord, we love you. We love you. We love you. Because you first loved us, oh God. We glorify your name, oh Lord. We just adore you right now. Just, beloved, just begin to adore the Lord and love him and worship him. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bow before you in adoration. We bow before you, Lord, in obeisance. We bow before you, O God, in worship. We love you. We exalt you. We glorify your name. You alone are to be praised. There is none, O God, like you. Before you there is none, and behind you there is none. Above you there is none, O oh God, and none can compare. We just love you, Lord, tonight. In Jesus' name, we love you. Right now, beloved, just um, come before the Lord with a heart of repentance, a heart of um you know, repentance, just ask the Lord for forgiveness of sins and cleansing so that we can come into his presence with, um, with holy hearts, with, um, he's a holy God. We want to come approach the presence of a holy God, having been washed and bathed by the blood of Jesus. Right now, just ask for forgiveness, ask for the washing and the bathing with the blood the cleansing of the blood. Let's begin to pray. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we come before you with, with um, hearts of humility, asking, O oh God, for you to look through our hearts, O oh God, and, conf and, and cleanse us of any unrighteousness. O oh Lord, we confess, O oh God, the sin of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the lust the pride of life for oh God, um, the sins that we committed with our lips, evil words that we spoke. Oh Lord, the sins we committed in our hearts and in our minds. Oh Lord, negativity and evil that we permitted, for oh God, into our hearts and in our minds. Lord, we ask for forgiveness, oh Lord. The things that we committed with our resources that you have blessed us with, we ask for forgiveness. We truly, O oh God, come before you in repentance, in, um, in humility, and we're asking, O oh God, for the cleansing of the blood in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for forgiveness. We thank you right now, O oh God, for um, your blood, for the cleansing of the blood, for the cleansing of your blood. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise. Oh, we give you glory. We are grateful, oh God, in to you. Bible, just drove away in the name between of my Jesus. I want out. Thank you, you blessing. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We give you all the praise. I would like us to sing a song of worship unto the Lord before we go into the teaching today, if possible. Um, You are my strength, strength like no other. You are my 
We thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We bless your name. We exalt you, Lord. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. Lord, we say be exalted in our lives. Be exalted in our circumstances. Be exalted, O oh God, in the highest heavens. Be exalted on the earth, O oh God. Thank you, Lord. There is none like unto you. We say, Lord, there is none like you. Among the gods there is none. You are glorious in holiness. You are fearful in praise. Thank you, Lord. Glory be unto your name. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. So um, good to see you all. Um, I hope and pray and trust 
that you guys are all doing great, uh, that you, God is um, keeping you safe in the shadows of the Almighty, shadows of the Most High. Um, that is the safest place to be in, in, the, in the center of God's will. Uh, we're going to go into the Word right away today, tonight. I believe that we got, we are, we are journeying through the book of First Corinthians. We are journeying through the book of First Corinthians. And um, we had gotten to chapter 6. Um, we finished with chapter 5. We probably haven't yet started chapter 6. And so we're going to pick up from chapter 6 tonight. But as a, a way of review, um, we already said that the purpose of the book of 1 Corinthians was to correct some things that were going on in the church in Corinth. Apostle Paul had started, you know, had established the church. Um, he had taught them a lot of things about the Christian faith, and then he established them, he strengthened them, and he left. And while he was away, he got reports that some things were not going well. There were lots of divisions. There was a lot of um, immorality. There were so many sins had, that had crept into the church. I don't know if that sounds familiar to us currently. I believe that this book is quite relevant to us today because the Christian church has been adulterated in many different ways. The Christian church, some people don't even want to go to church because they feel there is too much hypocrisy in church. There is too much um, sin in the church. If there is so much sin in the church, then why should we go there? That is their argument. But in natural fact, the church is still God's um, channel of salvation to the world. The church is still the place to go to find God. I mean, I'm not saying you cannot find God anywhere else, but then the church is still the house of God. And so the leaders of the church, just like the Apostle Paul did, the leaders of the church have to stand in the gap, you know, um, and, and correct what is going wrong. So there's nothing wrong with church leaders stepping in to correct things, intervening to correct things, to address things. We need to be on the lookout when sin creeps into the church, when injustice, when things are not going right. The leaders of the church, it is our responsibility, just like Apostle Paul said, the example to step in and correct things in the church. So um, the next time a pastor comes to you to talk to you about something that is not going quite right, please don't be offended. It is a biblical principle. Amen. It, it, it's so hard for us pastors to give feedback to people in these days because Every time we attempt to give feedback, it's seen as, um, oh, the pastor does not like me. Or um, it's seen as um, uh, in a negative light. I pray that is not the case in our churches. I pray that is not the case in our local church and in our churches. Um, let's let's um, be open to correction. The whole of uh, First Corinthians is correction correction for the church. And he mentioned particular things that need to be set right, that need to be corrected, and he addressed them. Um, he even went to the point of mentioning some names, you know, describing some individuals that need to be expelled from the church, um, and so that they can be restored, that they will not contaminate the church and brought back. Um, what, what an awesome example. Um, I, um, I pray that we don't have to go that far. We, in the current, uh, in our local church and then in our churches, don't have to go to the point of having to expel people for uh, sin, sinful lives that have been and that have entrenched, you know, that have that have um, taken hold um, in their lives, 
um, um, I pray. I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you are listening to me right now, I pray you will never, never um, get to the point where sin has taken hold of you. May God preserve you. May God preserve me. I pray that God will preserve his church to the point where if we sleep and fall, that we will rise up again, that we will not be so entrenched in sin to the point where I think in chapter five or four, the Apostle Paul talks about an individual that needed to be expelled from the church because of sinful behavior. Um, may God preserve you and may God preserve us. Amen. In chapter six, um, the Apostle Paul uh, is addressing the issue of the church going outside, outside the walls of the church, Christians going outside of the walls of the church to bring their matters, their conflicts, their disagreements uh, before judges and law courts in the unbelieving world. They are trying to seek a solution from unbelievers to, to resolve their issues. So he picked on that subject in chapter six. And this is what he says. He says, verse one, there dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Amen. And, um, and let me just continue in verse four. It says, if then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church? That's unbelievers, the heathen, least esteemed by the church to judge. Why would you go to an unbelieving judge, unbelieving lawyer, unbelieving um, authority to judge the cases among believers. And then in verse five, he says, I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? Wow. Not even one who will be able to judge between his brethren but brother goes to law against brother and that before unbelievers. Apostle Paul could not believe it. He could not believe that Christians will go outside of the church to have their cases judged by unbelievers. Uh, but I think that is happening. Um, it's become commonplace. I've had situations recently where um, um, a married couple had conflicts and the man wanted, or uh, one party wanted to go to the pastor. And the wife was like, no, I, the pastor knows us too well. Um, we don't want to endure that. She didn't want to go through that embarrassment of going to a person that knows her, okay? so to go outside of the church. She would have preferred that they went to a counselor, a secular counselor, um, you know, not even another pastor, right? Just a secular pastor, uh, counselor. Some Christians would prefer that type of thing. And Apostle Paul is condemning that behavior. He's saying that that is not right for Christians, which means that you know, he's not saying don't, don't use professionals. He's not saying don't use the services of professionals. I believe what he's saying is that if there are people in the church that are equally qualified, utilize the resources within the church. Because um, I have had people whose marriages were destroyed by secular counselors. You know, you have a conflict in your marriage. I mean, one particular couple, they had a conflict in their marriage. They went before a secular uh, counselor and, uh, and the counselor said, 
I have I don't know why you guys are married in the first place because you don't look compatible to me in any way. You don't seem to agree on things. You don't seem to, I mean, I, I have no idea why you are married in the first place. And that was the end of their marriage. That was the end of their marriage. If you went to a secular counselor and say you wanted to, you wanted help with divorce, they will help you to get divorced. If you went to a secular uh, 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 counselor, with anything that you go with, they help you to accomplish your goal. But if you went to a Christian counselor, a Christian counselor is not going to necessarily do what you want them to do. They are going to counsel you in light of the word, in the light of the word of God. You might go seeking divorce and they would find out if divorce is the right thing for you based on the word of God and the will of God. And that, that is the difference. So that's what Apostle Paul was trying to correct over there. And then he went on uh, verse 12, chapter 6, verse 12, um, and, and said, um, glorify God in body and spirit. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And then, so that, that statement is um, quite significant. He said, it is not all things that are permissible, all things that are lawful that we should do. Some of them are not, are not glorifying to God. Some of them are not glorifying to God. There may be things, I don't have a ready example right now, but there may be things that are legal, but they, are not, they don't glorify God. Divorce is legal, right? Divorce is legal, but does it glorify God? Not right necessarily. Um, bringing a brother or a sister before the law, maybe in, the, in court, is legal. Suing a brother or sister in the church, you know, taking your brother or sister to court is legal, but does it glorify God? I mean, so there, are, there may be many, many, many more examples, but remember, we are not doing a very in-depth study of the Bible. We are, walk, we are doing a Bible survey, so we are not going to go into details too much. Um, it's good enough that we can identify the concepts and the subjects and the direction in which Apostle Paul wants the church to go. That would be enough for our study, the kind of study that we are doing. Now the body, in verse 13, it says, now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Amen. So do not, what he's trying to say is that do not allow sexual immorality or anything that consummates the body, anything that um, you know uh, destroys the body, um, to compete with the Lord. Our body belongs to the Lord. We are the temple of the living God. And so um, I just want to mention that before we go on. Now, still in chapter 6, in verse 16, he says, Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her, for the two, he says, shall become one flesh, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Very, very important. He's talking about um, Christians and the way that we should, um, we should um, manage our bodies, which are the temple of the living God, um, and, um, and how a particular kind of sin, which is joining ourselves with harlots, with unbelievers, and with others that we are not married to, defiles the body of the, the body, the temple. Um, that when, when we commit sexual sin, we are actually becoming one with the other. People have become uh, chronically ill. People have become terminally ill through sexual sin. And also there are spiritual transfers or spiritual unions 
that take place during sexual sin. And so what he's trying to say is that if you are joined with the Lord, you are one spirit with him. So if you are joined with a demon-possessed person, you are also demon-possessed because you become one with that person. I pray that we, we will, the church, the church will take precautions and, um, and not allow things like this to contaminate the body. I pray that you and I will preserve ourselves unto the Lord and be joined with him. And you see, the key is that the more we are joined with the Lord, the less, the less likely we are to be joined with the world. So I would say, you see, the, the, the solution to sinfulness is the word of God, union, communion with the Lord. Uh, daily devotion. We, in Sunday school, we were taught, you know, if you want to grow, if you want to grow, hallelujah, read your Bible, pray every day, pray every day, pray every day. So there, right there, we have the solution to read our Bibles and pray every day. The Christian should continually, daily, moment by moment, flood our minds, our spirits, our minds, our spirits with the word of God. That is the way to win the Christian uh, battle, the, the, the battle of um, faith. In verse 19 and 20, and we are rounding up chapter 6 over there, Verse 19 and 20, he says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? This is a very important scripture to note. When we were younger Christians, that's one of the scriptures we were required to memorize. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, from whom, sorry, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, we are not your own, our own. And very often we get deceived into saying, it's my own body, I can decide what to do. That is a deception of the devil. It is a, a very, very um, evil deception. It is not, we don't own it. It, it can be taken away from us at any point in time, and we have no idea um, that we have, we, we don't have any control. Um, we, don't, we don't have ultimate control over our bodies. That's what the, the, the word is telling us. So we are like stewards. We are stewards, we are um, caretakers of the body, and we have to give an account for what we do with our physical bodies. For you were bought with, you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So it's telling us the owner, the true owner of our bodies and the true owner of our spirits is who? God Almighty. He's the true owner. Uh, that ends chapter six. Let's go to chapter seven and identify a few things over there, chapter seven of First Corinthians. Um, he goes into marriage, you know, it goes into the concept of marriage over there. I'm sorry, the institution of marriage. In verse uh, one, chapter seven, verse one, he says, now concerning the things of which you wrote to me. So that means a letter was written to him actually. And um, if you look at, um, there is a verse that we're going to look at later on that identifies the fact that a letter was actually, I think, Phoebe. Phoebe was the sister that um, I believe uh, carried the letter from the church um, uh, to Apostle Paul. Now, um, verse one, now concerning the things that you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. That means it's okay to not be married. It's okay. Um, he himself, remember, was not married. Um, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, 
let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her and likewise also to also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body and the husband does, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another. So he continues with this institution of marriage. Very, very, very important scriptures as far as marriage is concerned. That um, he says, listen, if you can stay without getting married, for the you know, so you can be dedicated to God and you know, not undistracted, go for it. He himself chose that option. But he realizes also that not everyone can do it. Not everyone can live a, a life of celibacy. So, um, so he, he, um, he says, listen, instead of living a life of sexual immorality, go ahead and get married. So a, one of the reasons for marriage is to prevent sexual sin. That is one of God's reasons, one of the biblical reasons for marriage, to prevent sexual immorality. And it's a valid reason um, because sexual immorality would destroy your body, would destroy your spirit, uh, would destroy your destiny. And so he said, avoid that at all costs and go ahead and get married. And when you get married, you, don't, you should give all the affection that is due your partner. You don't have full authority over your body at that time. Um, now your body belongs to the, your spouse as well as to God. So you have two, two owners of your body at that point when you're married. Uh, God is the ultimate owner, but your spouse also has rights to your body. And um, said, so because of that, do not deprive one another, um, except you've agreed, except with consent, consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Wow, that's, that's powerful. I, it's interesting to note that a single man has written these things. Um, so it can only be inspired. See, these are some of the things that point to the fact that the Bible, the Word of God is inspired by God. Because the Apostle Paul was not married. How could he write such deep things about marriage? Um, he, he, it must have been inspired um, by he, he, didn't, he was not even saying, oh, I have heard it told to me, or I've read it in a book. No, he, he said it with authority, which means that this is coming from an authentic, credible source. In verse 8, or verse 9, actually, um, he concluded by saying, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. It is better to marry than to burn with passion. So marriage is recommended over sexual uh, lust, sexual lust. So he has even gone beyond sexual immorality as in fornication. He has gone beyond that, not necessarily. What we are trying to prevent is not only, first of all, it is sexual morality in terms of fornication and all that, but even passion, the, the, the lust alone, the desire alone um, offends God. Because you remember that uh, our Lord Jesus Christ said that even if you lust over a woman, uh, you have committed the act already. So the lust alone is, so, is bad enough that it's better to get married. Um, all right? So marriage is highly recommended, but not, um, not required. Highly recommended, but not required. Then in verse 10, verse 10, he goes on to say, now to the married. So you can see that this man of God is actually just picking on one subject after another. 
one group of people after another group of people trying to address everyone's need, everyone, where everyone has gone wrong in the church. He is actually addressing every wrongdoing in the church. That's what he is doing. In, chap in verse 10, chapter 7, verse 10, now to the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. That means this commandment that I'm going to issue now is not just coming from me, it's coming from God. A wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, which should not happen, even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. He's talking about somebody who was not divorced, but just leaves, just takes off. You can just take off from your husband and get married to somebody else. Don't, it's sin. It is unacceptable. And a woman and a husband is not to divorce his wife. Wow. A husband is not to divorce his wife. Do we, do we see that happening in the church today? Or let me rather ask, don't we see that happening in the church today? So commonly, so frequently, I am, I am not here to judge, but um, I pray, I pray that we, we would be preserved. If you're married and you're listening to me right now, I pray, and if you're go, aspiring to get married, I pray that God will give us the grace. May God give us the grace, because there is so much evidence in the scriptures against divorce, that, um, if, even against taking, taking off. You can just get up and take off from your marital home. It's not recommended. Um, it, is, it is strongly abhorred. I mean, uh, God, God hates divorce, as the word says. But then he continues in verse 12 and says, back to the rest. That means that those who are not married, I think. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, so the Apostle Paul is saying that this command that is coming next is from, from me. It's not from the Lord. So he's differentiating between what is coming from God and what is not coming from God. If any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. If you have an unbelieving spouse, don't go ahead and divorce that spouse. That is also not to say that it's okay to marry an unbeliever. All right? But if you already have an unbelieving spouse and you came to be, be, believe, you have become a believer, and that's not the grounds to divorce your unbelieving spouse. Um, and the woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he's willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. Um, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and all that. So you, you, got, you got the concept over there. I'm not going to go too deep into it. Um, and there is a phrase that I want to mention uh, to, um, uh, to round up that discussion. It's in verse 15, chapter 7, verse 15, last end says, but God has called us to peace. God has called us to peace. So what I'm hearing here is that um, so long as separations and disagreements and marital conflicts are concerned, our overriding passion has to be in marriage and everywhere. Our overriding passion has to be peace, peace, peace. We should be people that are seeking peace at all times. Anywhere there is conflict, which our passion should be to seek peace, to make peace, to bring agreement. Even if there is disagreement, still let peace prevail. People who take off and argue and fight and you know, come back at each other, that is unchristian. He continues in 
I want to just mention a few verses. I think it's a very long chapter, chapter 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it's quite long. It has 40 verses in there, and um, I'm skipping verse 19. Verse 19, now he's talking about circumcision. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. <laughs> But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. You have to love this man. He's saying, look, look, it's Christianity is not about physical things. Christianity is not so much about rituals. It is not so much about, you know, what is done to the body and what, I mean, what, um, culture. It's not about things like that. God in the Old Testament commanded circumcision and all that as a sign that you belong to him and all that. But he said in, now in the new dispensation, what is most important is to, to keep the commandments of God. Far more important than to seek circumcision. So don't put down anybody that is uncircumcised. Don't don't uphold anybody that is circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Uh, very, very important. Very important. Um, all right, I am jumping to verse 29, and just gonna mention over there. He said, but this I say, brethren, the time is short. The time is short. So that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. Those who weep as though they did not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. Those who buy as though they did not possess. And those who use this world as not misusing it. For the form of this world is passing away. I think what the Apostle Paul is saying is that, listen, don't hold on to anything that is worldly. Don't hold on so dear to anything that is so worldly. Spouses, um, uh, possession, physical possessions. That, I mean, like people, some people when they're married, it's like I'm superior to others who are not married. Don't, don't fall into that temptation. Because the world, the form of this world, the things of this world, they are passing away. They are passing away. Don't use that as a way to rank people. This person is wealthier than others. So he needs to sit in the front pew on, in church. Um, yeah, he needs to be in the church executive committee. Um, this person is married, so they are more qualified. I know, I know that in some churches, they prefer to appoint married people to be pastors. Than, uh, and there is a reason behind it. I don't think it's so much like to say that they are more qualified, but they don't want young people who are unmarried coming into the ministry and misbehaving because they are not married. Uh, they want people that are married. I think research has shown that when people are married, they are more likely to be settled and more likely to fall into all these sexual entanglements. Um, but he said, don't rank people, don't value the things of this world so much because they are transient. They are passing away. You and I can see in our days now how economies are collapsing, um, powerful industries, the airline industry, the, transport, the whole transportation industry, um, stock markets are crumbling, you know, whole industry, like hospitality industry, the hotel industry, the restaurant industry is collapsing. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? You know, the, 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 the the form of this world is passing away. This is a time for us to hold on to things that matter the most. 
this is the time to really focus on what, what matters, what lasts, and what will stand the test of time. Okay, let's go on to, we are rounding up with chapter seven. Um, and let's, let me look at something in chapter, verse 35. And this I say for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, but for, but for what is proper, and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. I think this is all, this is the reason he's saying everything he's saying in chapter 7. He wants us to serve God, to be committed to the Lord without distraction. And I think that is why the Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church um, uh, does not allow their priests to be married because they want to prevent all form of distraction. But while they are trying to prevent distraction, they may be opening the door for lust, sexual lust and, um, and immorality. So it's a, it's a delicate balance. We may be married, but don't let your marriage, don't let your marriedness, excuse me to use that word, it's, it's not a word, please. Uh, <laughs> don't let your married, marriedness take you away from your commitment to God. God is still number one. So to avoid distraction is the reason he's saying all that he's saying. And um, all right, I would just want to reach up to a verse 39 to round up. A wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives, but if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. I just like the phrase only in the Lord. Beloved, it is recommended and it is, it is it is a given for us to marry only in the Lord. Only in the Lord. We need to marry in the Lord. Don't go outside of the faith to get married to, with an unbeliever. Um, it does not please God. Does not please God. And that's the way I would like to end chapter 7. I'll touch on chapter 8. I was hoping we'll go further today. Let's look at it. Uh, we have 10 minutes to go, and I just want to touch on chapter 8. Maybe we'll finish that. Uh, be sensitive to conscience in chapter 8. The Apostle Paul is saying, he's talking now about things that are offered, food that is offered to idols, and things that are offered to idols. So that means that there was a problem regarding that also in the church. Now, concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. He said a lot of introductory statements. I want to skip that and go to chapter and verse seven. First Corinthians chapter eight, verse seven. That's where he really hit the nail on the head. And he says that, um, however, there is, not, there, is, there is not in everyone that knowledge. I know that he said, I know we all know a lot of things. We know about the things of God. We know the scriptures. But not everybody knows the things that we know. For, for some, with consciousness of the idol, until now, eat it as a thin offered to an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. But food does not commend us to God. That's the point. Food does not commend us to God, nor um, for neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. Uh -huh. Apostle Paul is saying that food is not going to be the thing that would justify us. And food is not going to be the thing that would disqualify us from before the Lord. So, it does not matter whether the food is offered to idols or not. That is not going to make a difference whether you eat food that is offered to idols or not. But let's go on. Um, verse 9. But beware lest somehow this liberty of yours 
become a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge, shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat. I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Wow, wow. So he's saying that, listen, it does not matter what you eat and what you don't eat. That's not going to qualify or disqualify you before God. But if a weaker brother, a brother that does not know this, the things of the Lord so much, sees you eating food in, temp, in a, an idol's temple, they are going to say that, oh, it's a good thing to be eating in idol's temples. It's a good thing to do. They might even go to the point of sleeping in an idol's temple to do all the things that they do in an idol's temple because they saw you associating yourself with things in the idol's temple and you might mislead them. And he is saying that um, it is he's describing as, as a sin against the brethren sin against the brethren. And once you sin against the brethren and mislead them, you also sin against Christ. Therefore, if I would do anything that will make my brother stumble, verse 13, I think it's a very important verse to write down. First Corinthians chapter seven, chapter eight, verse 13. First Corinthians eight thirteen. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat. I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. And let's broaden it, beloved. Anything that we will do, which will make another person stumble, we should refrain from doing it. Create a long distance, a far distance from any resemblance of sin that will make others you know, um, stumble, that will make others stumble. Um, it, it's as if um, a Christian brother who goes to visit a Christian sister in the middle of the night, you've done nothing, nothing intimate happened, you did not sin against the Lord, but then unbelievers or younger Christians saw you, they may become emboldened to engage in such activities and as for, they might actually fall in sin because of that. So things that look like sin should be avoided as much as possible so that we don't mislead weaker, the weaker brothers and weaker brethren. Um, and I'm going to stop it there because our time is up. We, we still have some room, uh, some, um, we, we were believing God to finish. Uh, I think we will try. We have how many, how many um, Wednesdays do we have to go? I think we have the 22nd and the 29th. Yeah, we, we, we are on course. We have 16 chapters in the first book of Corinthians, and we've just covered up to chapter eight. We are going to do possibly chapter nine to 13 uh, next week, and then we will uh, finish up the week after. So I think we're making good, good progress here. I, I am just excited, I don't know about you, but just excited that, um, we, you know, we used to read the Bible in pieces. We quote here, First Corinthians, we quote from Job, we quote from that end, we quote from the middle, from the beginning, just to 
drive home a point, but we have never as a church, as a local congregation, um, taken our time systematically to familiarize ourselves with, you know, it's like building on precept, precept upon precept, surveying, walking through the Bible, uh, all the chapters, all the books consistently, systematically. And I think it's a great opportunity, great opportunity to do that. I'm, I'm so excited. I hope you are as well. Um, thank you so much for studying with me, for coming around week by week. I am so encouraged and I want to pray uh, for you. And after this, I just want you to spend, um, take a minute to give unto the Lord. Go to impactchapel.org, impactchapel.org, please. Let's be faithful. As we have been faithful in attending these sessions, let's also be faithful in uh, giving to the Lord. And I know that the Lord who sees in secret will bless you publicly. May the Lord make a public show of you um, as a person that has honored him in secret. I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, as you have been faithful, applying yourself to the word week by week, and are giving faithfully unto the Lord. Father, I pray that you will look in our direction of God. I pray, Lord, if anything, if nothing at all, help us to live the Christian life and win in the Christian journey, Lord. I help us, O oh Lord, to endure. Help us to persevere. Help us to finish the race. Thank you, Lord. I pray for my sisters. Pray for my brethren on this line right now. Strengthen us that we will finish the race to the glory of God. We give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I'm going to unmute everybody and I'm going to ask that we share the grace. Now we share the grace together. I hope I can find the unmute all button. Participants, unmute all. Here we go. Fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Today is the day of our lives. We shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Let's keep checking in on each other and another. Okay?